Welcome, good morning, good afternoon. Please give us a couple more seconds until we all gather for this wonderful event. So we're still letting people in and we'll start momentarily. Good morning in the US and Canada. Good afternoon in Europe. I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation in Washington, DC. My name is Knut Pankmin. I serve as the program officer of economic and social policy in our DC office. This is a live stream event in our series on COVID-19 and its effects on workers and unions. Thank you for tuning in and for joining us. A special thank you to my colleague Jordan Leichnitz in Ottawa for her leadership in making this event possible. Today, we would like to take a critical look at labor rights in the US, Germany, and Canada. How has the pandemic challenged workers' rights? And how are unions fighting back? Let me welcome our wonderful guests and introduce the moderator for today's discussion, Sarah Morgan. Sarah is the Senior Government Relations Officer for the Washington DC Office of the International Labor Organization, or better known as ILO. Prior to joining the ILO, she worked for over 10 years at the Department of State for the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Before I hand over to Sarah, a quick note on how you can participate today. You can use the Q&A button that you will find at the bottom of the Zoom platform, or if you join us via live stream on Facebook or YouTube, please use the chat feature to ask a question. And finally, a short ad for an upcoming event. Our friends at the Kamanovitz Initiative will host an international convening on constructing a new social compact that will start tomorrow and end fittingly on May Day. Both FES and LO have been involved in planning this conference, and we will have conversations on immigration, the gig economy, healthcare, climate change, racial justice, and much more with scholars, activists, workers, and labor leaders. I will post a link in the chat later, so if you'd like to participate, you can still register for this event. And now with this, I will say thank you, hand it over to our wonderful moderator, Sarah. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Knut, and thanks very much to FES for the opportunity. I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to join all of you here today for this discussion. And I think it's gonna be great because we have an excellent uh, panel here of uh, three different people. So I'll introduce first and then give you a bit of a sense of, of how the conversation will proceed. But I'm really pleased, as I said, to be joined by three excellent speakers for this discussion today. First, we have Wilma Liebman, who is the former chair of the National Labor Relations Board. She presently serves as the president-elect of the Labor and Employment Relations Association, or LARA, and as chief external ethics officer for the United Auto Workers. Union. Then we have Dirk Newman, who is the head of the Work Design and Qualification Policy on the Executive Board of IG Metall, the German Metal Workers Union. He has a background in social policy and previously worked at the Federal Board of the German Trade Union Confederation. And last but certainly not least, we have Raoul Gerbert. He is an assistant professor at the Université de Sherbrooke in Quebec, Canada. His areas of expertise include labor relations, collective bargaining, labor law, and globalization. So thanks to all three of you for joining today. I'm really excited for the discussion. And as we reflect after over a year of the pandemic on the challenges it has generated and some of the lessons we have learned, I'm hoping we can start off by, by sort of setting the scene because we have examples from the US, from Germany, from Canada, you know, globally, the latest figures from the ILO, for example, show that 8.8% of the global working hours were lost over the whole of last year. And in our estimation, that's the equivalent of 255 million full-time jobs if we're looking at a 48-hour work week, which is four times greater approximately than the number of jobs lost during the 2009 global financial crisis. So if we think back to that, I'm hoping each of you can give us a bit of the context 
in the US, Germany, and Canada and the current situation. What does the labor relations um, scene look like in each country? And what is the situation after over a year in the pandemic? Wilma, can we, can we maybe start with you? Surely, thank you, Sarah. And thank you for, to the FES for the opportunity to, to be a part of this discussion. Um, let me start by saying that obviously for all of us this last year and its intersecting crises have been like nothing we've ever experienced before. Uh, with particular focus on the topic for today, I think the US is probably an outlier compared to Germany and compared to Canada in terms of just how significant the labor relations picture has been in uh, protecting workers during this pandemic. So just a word about our labor relations system in the US for those who may not know, uh, we are operating under the 1935 depression era, New Deal era labor law, which sets up a collective bargaining model based on exclusive representation of employees in a bargaining unit uh, based on majority support. So if a union doesn't have majority support, there's no representation. At this point, uh, union density in the private sector is less than 7%. There has been a steady decline since the 1950s with the bargaining power of workers uh, having eroded over the last few decades leading to glaring inequality. We have no concept of tripartism or social dialogue. We have no mechanisms, mandates, or incentives to engage in anything like social dialogue, which is considered a pretty foreign concept over here. Um, and even I think as compared with Canada, there is a lack of legitimacy in our public sphere about trade unions as institutions of democratic society. Um, nonetheless, um, polls show increasing approval of unions and over the last five or more years, there has been accelerating worker activism, bringing these issues very much to the forefront. Um, so during the pandemic very quickly, the toll on workers has overlapped but varied. And I see it as uh, in three categories uh, in which has comp comp complicated the calculus for how to deal with the situation during the pandemic and of course, how to deal with the reopening. So there are those number one who lost work, hospitality, travel, uh, performers, artists, dancers, uh, childcare facilities, for example. Um, so slowly these industries are beginning to return but we will likely see restructuring. Then there are those workers, probably largely work, work white collar, who were able to work from home remotely. Uh, and they dealt with childcare demands, especially mothers with children, uh, as childcare centers closed. There were mental health issues from the isolation, uh, workers dealing with tracking and surveillance of their performance, uh, working time issues, stress related to all these issues, the right to disconnect. Uh, extra costs that were imposed on them at home. And of course, leading to the question of what's the future of the office gonna be. Uh, and then the third bucket of workers would be the essential workers uh, for whom there was obviously uh, an extreme amount of attention. Um, their plight put into stark relief, the desperation that many of them were suffering with increasing poverty, hunger, food insecurity, um, so there were healthcare workers, um, food, food sector workers, uh, and uh, construction, warehouse and delivery workers, retail workers. So different buckets of essential workers. Uh, a recent Washington Post uh, survey found that a year into the pandemic, roughly three in 10 healthcare workers have considered leaving their profession. More than half say they are burned out. About six in 10 say that the stress from the pandemic has harmed their mental health. Uh, there have been suicides, trauma and disillusionment. Many say that their disillusionment tracks back to how the pandemic exposed and magnified the broken parts of America's healthcare system. Uh, in the food industry, scores of workers have died from farm workers to chefs, to restaurant servers and meat plant workers. Um, so I guess I'll close with just two points. 
where these workers have had unions, they've had some protections and ability to bargain over protections. Otherwise, there is no institutionalized voice or ability for workers to try to secure some protections from their employers. And last, um, these issues are in the US extremely politicized and polarized, including over health and safety, safety issues such as wearing a mask, which has been a fraud issue. Uh, many of the laws regulating the pandemic have come from state governments, a majority of them are Republican and the policies follow, leading to a patchwork of laws which vary by location and fears of a two-tiered society. So I'll close with that. Thanks, Wilma. Certainly a lot that I hope we can get into uh, throughout the discussion today. Um, maybe Dirk, can I turn to you next? Wilma mentioned a couple of things. She's an out, uh, as the US as an outlier of a system, social dialogue, you know, dialogue between workers, employers, and, and, you, and the government. And I wonder if you can give us a picture of the system in Germany. What have you seen? How is it different or the same? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And first of all, thanks to FES for the organization and the invitation to this discussion. Um, of course, as in many other countries, too, we have a very different situation, even at workplaces at the moment. So Wilma already mentioned some of the differences between or depending on which job you have. You know, so last but not least, IG Metal, as you introduced, is the trade union for the metal workers or in the steel um, uh, making industry, but as well as for textile industry and um, wood and plastic progressing and so on. So we organize um, workers in different sectors, but most of them are in the industry sector. Of course, there is a completely different situation for those um, um, that work in jobs like nurses, like um, care of the elderly, those who work in supermarkets, in the public service, public transport, and so on. But these are not our members, honestly. So I cannot speak very much for them and for their situation. But there is a different situation in the companies of the industry, of course, as well. You know, you have to um, differ uh, to to make differences between traditional words, blue collars and white collars. Most of the white collars um, are in home office at the moment. Um, and then this week, they have to go there and they have to stay there. So it is um, regulated that they have to use home office offers of their employers. On the other way, the blue collars, they have to go to the factories. They have to go to the workplaces, to the production, area, production areas in the companies. And this is part of a situation which is really difficult for us as an industry union, of course, because our members are white collars and blue collars as well. And what we realize is um, more and more a split within the um, employees um, of uh, almost any company. You know, there are the white collars, stay at home, feeling safety. Maybe they aren't, but in the opinion of blue collars, this is an additional privilege to stay at home in the pandemic situation while they have to leave houses day by day, go to the workplace, meet other people in the buses, in the trains, then meet other people when they enter the company, meet other people at the workplace and so on and so on. So of course there, feeling of being more uh, in danger and uh, having a higher risk of an infection with the coronavirus um, is a really big problem, in my opinion, for this, what traditionally unions stand for, the idea of solidarity of the employees. And this is, for me personally, a not easy situation at the moment, of course, while um, trade union actions go on. You know, we had collective bargainings over the last few months and weeks, and we have um, strike actions, rallies um, to fight against um, losing jobs in companies. I can show some pictures later maybe on this issue. However, um, it is a situation that isn't easy for us at the trade union. Um, in addition, however, we have a system of Wilma, you mentioned it already, social dialogue um, of three partaking. Um, it worked rather well um, to um, afford over the last few months to enforce um, binding rules 
and regulations for workplaces and for occupational health and safety. You know, we have a traditional system to come together with employers, uh, trade unions and the government. We have um, places at the moment, of course, virtual places, virtual ta round tables to come together, uh, together and um, to deal out, to, you know, to negotiate um, rules for health and safety at workplaces, of course. Um, maybe I can explain a bit more in detail later on and, and for the moment, um, not to take too much time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dirk, and, and I think we'll all look forward to hearing how collective bargaining has worked in, in the times of COVID and, and a little bit longer, later in the program. Uh, Raul, what about Canada? Yes, good morning, everyone, and um, I'll, I'll start like Wilma, just with a brief overview, maybe the Canadian system for those who don't know it, while uh, in terms of healthcare, it, it actually is sort of a European style uh, welfare system uh, in terms of labor relations, uh, it is very much a Wagner Act uh, US uh, style system with majority representation as Wilma uh, explained. And um, uh, while on, on the healthcare side, certainly the, the uh, more um, universal uh, aspect of the healthcare system has served Canada well, I would say, uh, on the labor side, we have the same types of problems uh, uh, in employment, uh, especially also in the uh, heavily unionized sectors uh, and some heavily unionized sectors have slumped uh, and the impact on workers really differ from whether you get uh, union protection or not. Dirk just mentioned uh, people who just, you know, don't have the privilege of working from home and that's very much a Canadian, uh, uh, Canadian phenomenon as well with a lot of the uh, poorer racialized service sector workers who don't have union protection and who don't have a choice. They do have to show up at the workplace and then they don't get to bargain in terms of protection equipment. Now, what I wanted to say on the outset in terms of the um, uh, impact in Canada is, uh, first of all, it's, it's also uh, a, uh, a patchwork. So uh, provinces uh, make rules in terms of labor and in terms of the uh, pandemic. Uh, in terms of the economic impact, however, it doesn't really seem to matter uh, what type of uh, um, approach was taken, a, a more sort of uh, uh, harm reduction Danish approach or a, a, a somewhat heavier uh, French approach or the sort of Texas, we don't know what this virus is approach. Uh, um, the employment impact has been anywhere between minus two and minus five percent December to December overall in the different provinces. Uh, and um, uh, then in terms of the labor impact, uh, the public sector certainly has been hard hit and it's, it's heavily unionized, 75, 80%, depending on the province. Um, collective agreements have been either suspended or modified unilaterally. Uh, and there's been a lot of fights around uh, protective equipment. So we don't necessarily, unfortunately, have the same uh, collaborative uh, approach to, uh, to protective equipment. Uh, uh, there, there's been fights around ventilation in classrooms, return to in-person teaching in, in uh, schools, uh, uh, some premiums for very low paid healthcare uh, workers, but really not that much in terms of monetary uh, uh, gains that unions got uh, were able to get in return. Uh, then in terms of private sectors, the heavily unionized sort of mining, manufacturing, uh, transport of goods, uh, there has been a slight uh, drop in employment, but they, they've, most of them, either they never left uh, work or they've been back uh, for a while now. Um, uh, there have been some premiums negotiated for workers in supermarkets and meatpacking. They were temporary from what I understand in most cases. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how the next bargaining rounds, uh, now that we actually know, you know what essential workers look like so that we can eat, uh, hopefully in some of these uh, still relatively well unionized uh, sectors, hopefully there, there'll be uh, some impact. Um, uh, a lot of collective agreements were extended by mutual um, agreement, like the bargaining rounds didn't really happen in the same way uh, during the pandemic. So there's a little bit of an impact uh, uh, there as well in terms of the, uh, the negotiating system. Um, and then finally, you have these sort of catastrophic uh, sectors, uh, air travel, uh, hotels, tourism, and they're still quite unionized in Canada, but um, we, we just don't know in terms of the permanent employment impact in these sectors yet. And then hopefully later, we'll get to talk a little bit about the policy aspect, the public policy aspect as well. I, I do feel that Canadian unions were able to um, make some gains there, but hopefully we can come back to uh, those questions a little bit later during the panel. Thank you very much. And Looking forward to the discussion. 
Thanks, Raul. And for sure, on the policy on the policy discussions, I think that'll be an interesting aspect to see the differences between the three different countries. Um, Wilma, I'd like to I'd like to turn back to you though now to get into a little bit more of what you were talking about at the beginning. You mentioned the disparate impact on on these three different groups of of workers, and it's a theme that I think both Dirk and Raul also picked up on. I wonder if you can expand a bit on this and share some of your thoughts on any of the key issues that have been revealed um, as a result of COVID-19 on, on more of the structural inequalities or, or yeah. harms. Sure, yes. Um, so in the US, of course, we had not only the pandemic and the related economic crisis, but we also had intersecting racial justice, democracy, and climate crises. Um, and these intersecting crises uh, it's hard to imagine we could have endured more crises at one time, um, but they have clearly exposed, highlighted, and exacerbated uh, pre-existing economic injustices and structural weaknesses. Um, these are injustices and weaknesses that have prevailed for a long time. Um, these crises have made palpable the catastrophic consequences of decades of governments failing to address social problems. Social problems like stagnating wages, disappearing jobs, a weak social safety net, a broken healthcare system, declining worker power, a long-term decline in labor's share of total national income, accelerating inequality of many dimensions, populist anger, and what have been called deaths of despair, which is the uh, life expectancy falling for two thirds of Americans without a bachelor's degree. Um, as uh, George Packer, a wonderful author, wrote in the Atlantic last June, the coronavirus didn't break America, it revealed what was already broken. Um, this, the COVID recession has been called the most unequal recession in modern US history. Uh, the job losses from the pandemic overwhelmingly affected low wage minority workers the most, many of them the, what we call the essential workers. Seven months into the recovery, black women, black men and mothers of school aged children are taking the longest time to regain employment. And the recession's inequality is a reflection of the virus itself, which has caused more deaths in low income communities and severely affected jobs in restaurants, hotels, and entertainment venues. Uh, these are jobs overwhelmingly held by women and people of color. And no other recession in modern history has so pummeled society's most vulnerable. The disparities are, are evident in terms of income and wealth, gender and race, and they show up in both the health and the economic outcomes. Um, the recovery is picking up a bit, but it is still a work in progress and also deeply unequal. Uh, just in this morning's Washington Post, there was a headline that women and people of color are the most likely to say they are financially worse off today than before the pan get pandemic began. Uh, wealthy, wealthier Americans are doing better, particularly those with stock portfolios. Uh, while Black, Hispanic, and Asian American communities can continue to suffer deep, deeper job and business losses. Uh, school closures have, has, have worsened social inequality as children who lack access to private schooling or the internet and adult supervision will be left behind. Uh, there are racial disparities. Black women have experienced almost twice the job losses as their white counterparts. Uh, Black and Latino Americans who disproportionately make up the country's frontline workers are dying at higher rates than white and Asian peers. And then perhaps less, um, what's well, gotten a little less attention than racial and socioeconomic impacts are gender dimensions of the pandemic. I've touched on this a little bit, but women and girls uh, have suffered disproportionately during the crisis in terms of job losses, lockdowns, increasing domestic violence, lapses in maternity care, mental health problems, and an increasing burden of domestic labor and childcare. Um, and since the pandemic primarily hit service sectors like hospitality and restaurants, women account for a larger share of employment, much more than men. Um, 
in the past, um, in past crises, uh, the impacts of the recession uh, have really hit much more on men because of the types of jobs and manufacturing. But this time the impact was sort, certainly more uh, on women. Uh, unions, as I said earlier, where, where they represent workers have been able to negotiate some protections. Um, one I would particularly mention and um, maybe I, an outlier in the US context is the uh, local 1199 of the Service Employees Union in New York has a contract with the League of Hospitals, uh, which includes 90 major hospitals in the city. And they report that they have been able to solve a lot of problems very collaboratively with the League and the, and the hospitals. Uh, they've also bargained with a few employers over a shared work program. Um, and other unions have been able to negotiate some protections or to, to lobby for protections, such as uh, the big hospitality union, Unite Here, successfully uh, lobbied for a bill enacted in California recently that will require that hospitality industry workers be brought back in seniority order uh, as the hotels begin to reopen. Um, so um, I just wanna close with mentioning uh, last fall, the um, AFL-CIO and the Service Employees Union filed a complaint with the ILO uh, against the governments claiming that their response to the pandemic uh, was in violation of ILO conventions on freedom of association and collective bargaining. As the complaint makes clear, there were certainly pre-existing violations under American labor law uh, of ILO conventions, which have just been made much worse by the way the Trump administration handled the pandemic. Uh, again, it, highlighting and exacerbating the existing deficiencies, including exclusions of certain workers like domestic and farm workers from the coverage of the labor law. The complaint also uh, pointed to the failure of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration to issue emergency regulations uh, dealing with the pandemic. They issued only voluntary guidelines, uh, leaving a lot of people uh, unprotected. So I'll, I'll close with that for now. Thanks, thanks, Wilma. And, and uh, I, I think it's really interesting to think about you know, the examples in the US where collective bargaining has helped and, and we'll see what will happen as that goes forward. Raul, I was really interested to hear you mention the significant collective bargaining coverage in the public sector in Canada. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about the Canadian system, how collective bargaining fits into that and, and the role it's played here in COVID. Yeah, so the, the uh, uh public sector is usually covered by its own uh, bargaining uh, laws. There's usually sector level bargaining, uh, uh, sort of framework agreements, and then filtering down into various uh, healthcare and education settings, depending on uh, sometimes job categories and, and others. So, uh, but it's also, this is probably also where from one province to another, you will see uh, the, the, the largest variation. Um, uh, in, in terms of uh, employment in these sectors, I mean, I, I was uh, uh, inspired to actually look it up. Uh, we have the same impact in the in the uh, so healthcare sector employment is down by a certain percentage uh, uh, December to December, and I think it's similar impacts uh, from what Wilma said earlier. People are uh, discouraged, they're tired, they're burned out, um, and they don't feel protected enough. They don't feel like they're actually uh, valued enough. Um, whereas um, for now, at least education seems to be significantly up in terms of employment, in terms of public sector employment. So uh, maybe this is uh, some, of the, uh, some of the items. Um, I, 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 I wanted to react to Wilma's uh, uh, um, uh, story as well about the sort of unequal uh, recession. And there's some data on this now in, in Canada as well. Um, it seems to be especially, so, so the, the uh, sort of core age group 25 to 55 seems to be fine in terms of employment. Uh, it's basically stable uh, by now. December to December, um, with vast differences in, in various sectors, of course. Um, uh, it's, it's women workers over a certain age, uh, over 55, that ha have seen a huge drop in uh, labor market participation and in employment opportunities. 
and and any younger workers, uh, male and female under 24. Uh, and this is not surprising uh, with the types of jobs that have been lost in the service sectors. Uh, so uh, very much as Dirk mentioned, uh, it's a question of privilege, whether you lost your job here uh, or whether you kept it and uh, are working from home uh, with the wonderful white wall behind you and uh, uh, you know, uh, cash in your paycheck every um, every month or so. Um, so maybe I hope that answers your question in terms of the public sector uh, and or um, um, uh, the inequality of the of the outcome of this uh, of this pandemic. Um, and then in terms of the public policy response, there was some um, relatively quick, relatively bureaucratic response from the federal government. Uh, so the unemployment insurance is one of those federal systems in uh, in Canada it is not provincial and uh, so we got CERB the emergency uh, response benefit uh, which was suspended uh, even for the first time to people like students and, and some uh, self-employed people um, that was a bit surprising almost like a basic minimum income there uh, careful the liberal and conservative governments it may have worked and you might have to do it again um, uh, and yes, maybe later we can talk about some of the other public policy aspects. I don't want to take uh, too much time right now. Well, actually, maybe just a little bit of, of additional time, Raul, uh, if, if you want, because I think that idea of the unemployment insurance, you know, it, all three governments, as far as I know, have taken a, a different response. So I'd be interested in, in Canada and what you think. Sure. So beyond the sort of employment insurance that continued to be sort of at the core of the uh, income replacement, uh, there was a pretty straight up uh, German inspired uh, job share and wage subsidy program for companies so that they don't they wouldn't need to uh, throw everybody out uh, with the um, uh, with the crisis. So there something has been learned here transatlantic wise uh, since the 2008 crisis where that wasn't the case in Canada. Uh, so I would say that the Kurzarbeit uh, model has, has really uh, uh, shown some effects here. Um, now, the question with all of these public policy uh, things is, uh, it's, a, it's a microcosm right now. It's a liberal minority government propped up by a social democratic party. Uh, it's, a, it's a time of crisis, uh, so there was uh, significant spending and significant pressure exerted to make this happen. Uh, the question is, once the uh, you know, regular uh, political mode sets in again and liberal and conservative governments then go into austerity measures, uh, they, there might be an election this fall and it might return uh, to some majority government as well, uh, lead, you know, taking away that uh, balance of power. Um, we'll have to see whether any of these gains in terms of public policy that unions and their allies made in, in, in Ottawa, whether they're stable or not, and certainly on a provincial level with uh, some of the more right-wing governments in Ontario and Quebec and Alberta and various provinces, uh, it's, been, it's been hard even to get a couple sick days out of, uh, out of the provincial government. Can you imagine doing a pandemic without paid sick days, right? It's, it's, it's the worst idea ever. Um, I can't imagine a pandemic without some sick days. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I think that ties back to a lot of the questions that have been raised uh, about the disparate impact and uh, on different groups of workers as well. Um, it, maybe uh, turning to to Dirk and and without me attempting to pr pronounce the job sharing <laughs> program in German, uh, Dirk, I am interested to hear about. You know, we hear a lot about um, learning from the German model and and around job sharing and keeping people, you know, it, attached to their jobs versus relying on an unemployment insurance scheme. And, and you had mentioned a lot, a, a little bit about um, the social dialogue around occupational safety and health discussions uh, specifically here. So I, I wonder if you can expand on some of that and, and give us some insights on your experience in particular as, as the unionist among us, uh, how, it's, how it's worked. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Maybe I, maybe I can pick up um, something um, Raoul mentioned before um, in the beginning. Um, of course, what you call Kurzarbeit, and Kurzarbeit, I get it, um, is something you can um, maybe um, call it a short time allowance, you know. And this, the idea is that if a 
company, an employer has to um, cut down the production, for example, for temporary short time, maximum 24 months, then um, the idea is, of course, not uh, that, that people should not lose the jobs, but stay in the company, keep the job, maybe not go to work or only go part time to work and the um, income that they will lose will be um, compensated by the unemployment insurance and you can get for um, 24 months up to um, 87 percent of the loss of income so if you for example, uh, we had a shutdown in March last year at most companies. So, for example, our car production stood still. You know, Volkswagen, um, Mercedes-Benz, BMW, they, or most of them stopped production for a couple of weeks. And at that time, you don't have work, of course, or many people don't have work, except, uh, especially blue colors. So they can um, ask the unemployment insurance for this short time allowance, and then they get up to 87% um, of their um, loss of income. Um, this instrument, of course, protects employees from losing the jobs, but um, even more, during this period of short time, um, there are extensive offers, for example, for further education, training, and so on. So you can um, gain additional qualifications in this time. Um, I think this is a good idea. And um, of course, we as unions um, fight for this or fought for this again in the pandemic situation to um, rise it. And to give you an impression, we had an unemployment rate of uh, about 5% in 2019, and the expected unemployment rate for 2021 is 6.3%. Um, so you can see unemployment might not rise too much. Of course, this is a view in cross. You know, for everyone who loses a job, it's a big problem. And of course, there might be right differences between the sector you work in, between the company you work for, and so on and so on. Well, this is the one side of the story. Now, let me turn to the uh, idea of social dialogue in um, this um, situation of the pandemic. Um, as I mentioned before, there is a an, an tradition, a well-established procedure, um, especially um, to cooperate with employers, trade unionists, the government and additional actors, for example, from the science, um, in creation of um, occupational safety regulations. And those regulations then will be pending for employers. So they have to follow those rules. If they don't, they can be um, um, charged with a fee. Um, in the concrete situation of the pandemic, first, um, very early in March, I think last year or in April, the um, government especially the Ministry, uh, Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs um, um, organized a dialogue between employers, trade unions, science, and the government um, to bring out something they call the occupational safety standard. This is a paper of about I think six or seven pages um, with general ideas on measures to set um, into the companies to, um, uh, to um, um, lower the risk of infections. Um, but this wasn't really binding. So we ask and we fought for the next step to use this traditional instrument of um, occupational health and safety regulations. We made this in many, many other points, for example, on working on screens. There is an um, occupational safety regulation in Germany, or um, on, I, I don't know, on how, how many lights you need on a workplace in the office, for example. So we use this instrument, this idea in the pandemic situation as well. And we um, negotiated and dealed out um, a regulation. This is, I think it's almost 24 pages. I've got it here. I can send it to you or maybe um, make a link in the chat. It's in English. You can read it in English, yeah, and you can find out what an employer has to do in the moment at workplaces to save um, or to low the risk of infections for the employees. Um, I think this is on the one hand really successful and it's um, honored by um, employees as well. 80% 
roundabout, not representative, but 80% of the employees in our um, branches and sections um, tell us that they are in general are satisfied with, um, with um, the, the measures. But on the other hand, on a pandemic, in a pandemic situation, 20% that are not satisfied with their health and safety situation is too much, of course. But in general, I think um, it worked um, good with this traditional instrument and idea. I hope you could understand. <laughs> yeah, no, of course. And I, I look forward to seeing the 24 pages uh, of, of, the, of the regulation. Um, just a couple of, of notes. We have about 20 minutes or 19 minutes left. So if you do have questions, as Knut mentioned at the beginning, please feel free to put them into the chat and we'll, we'll try and get to as many as we can. Um, and Dirk, I know you have some photos of collective bargaining and discussions, uh, strike action in practice. Uh, so I wanna get to those, but maybe I'll turn to Wilma just very briefly because we've heard about the, a little bit about the systems uh, in Canada and, and Germany, uh, maybe just a minute or two on a, the US and then Dirk will turn back to you for some of the photos. Well, uh, remarkably for the US during the Trump administration, the Congress uh, did get over its aversion to deficit spending uh, and enacted an extended unemployment compensation program, including uh, remarkably for gig workers to participate in, in the unemployment benefits. Um, it, there was also what was called the payroll protection program that enabled small businesses to apply for loans, which would be forgiven if they shared the, the loans with their workers uh, to maintain income. Um, I am told that some employers have actually been asked to bargain over how they are spending those funds. Um, the funds were certainly intended for income and um, I guess some employers decided they didn't wanna necessarily provide added income so that it raised bargaining issues. Um, uh, Knut actually put in the chat something that I wasn't familiar with he said that some US states such as Maryland have enacted or have in place similar uh, short time work schemes. Um, but he said barely anyone knows about it and they are not easily scaled up. Uh, I would say that's an understatement that barely anyone knows about it. I, I didn't know that those state laws ex existed. Um, one other state law that about I think 14 or 15 states do have laws that mandate the creation of uh, worker management safety and health committees. Um, when I mention that this is an issue here to Europeans, they always just shake their head and say, can't believe that that's even an issue in the US. So as I said, you know, no real institutions of social dialogue in the US, um, but the spending certainly during uh, the Trump administration and now the fiscal supports enacted uh, under the Biden administration, further stimulus are going to go a long way, I think, in in helping the U.S. recover. Thanks, Wilma. Um, I, I also wasn't aware of that, Knut, so uh, we're all learning something here today, which is great. Um, so Dirk, can I turn back to you and see uh, some of the pictures and you can give us just a little bit of a, of a flavor of strike action and collective bargaining in times of, of COVID-19. And then I apologize, everyone. I said, type, I said type questions in the chat. I, of course, meant in the Q&A function, which all of you have figured out. So uh, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Of course, I try to be very quick. Um, when we had a pre-meeting last week, we had the idea just to show you how trade union work uh, takes place at the moment. And so I'll try to share just a few impressions. Um, so this everyone might remember, um, this is a memory. This was trade union activity in 2019 before the pandemic. This is a strike action for higher wages, better working conditions in front of the headquarter of BMW in Munich. Um, this is long time ago, same as this. This was a rally took place in Berlin in 2019, just to give you a memory on how we dealt with trade union work before this happened. So it was, of course, the coronavirus, the pandemic situation, everything's changed, everything changed. And the, the um, issue was, how shall we um, deal or how shall we continue our trade union work in situation where we have, of course, 
danger of losing jobs, of um, collective bargaining and so on. Though just to give you an impression, in normal times there should be standing a couple of thousands of people if in this example, Airbus company um, um, decided to cut jobs, to, to um, cut down jobs. Uh, and this time we uh, took chairs in front of the, uh, or brought chairs in front of the uh, company. And you can see those pictures and every photo here on those chairs stands for one place, uh, one job that should be cut. So just to try to produce some pictures that brings some emotions of the problem of the workers, of course. Then, um, well, of course, keep the distance. This is one of the um, main topics in the pandemic. So collective bargaining, keep the distance. You can't read this sentence on those um, um, folding rule or inch rule. I don't know exactly what you call it. Mit Abstand die besten Kollegen, and this means um, with distance, the best colleagues, but in German, with distance, mit Abstand has another meaning and means by far the best colleague. So this is a play with those words, of course. And you can see everyone um, keeps the rules and keep the distance and uses those inch rules to um, check if the distance is good enough. And then, well, wear the mask. Of course, this doesn't really look like those rallies in Berlin or in Munich two years before. But this is how we organize strike act activities at the moment. Um, well, and same at this. Still strong together, of course, but we use, for example, drive-in um, movie theaters or park spaces like this one. And everyone uses his car just to show the employers, we are still here, we are still unions, we are still um, live still solidarity and we fight for our rights and for better working conditions. Thank you so much, just to give you a short impression. That's great. And uh, new and innovative techniques that I found out once screen sharing is off, the mute button disappears and goes somewhere else on your Zoom. Uh, but thanks very much, Dirk. I, so we have a lot of questions, which is great. And, and I think a number of them tie back into some of the discussion earlier. Um, and in particular, I wanna go back to something that Raul and Wilma both mentioned uh, and, and Dirk as well about the, the again, the disparate impact and, and equity issues. Uh, and so a couple of things. One, uh, one of the questions notes that we see a lack of specific recovery measures targeting youth in Europe. And if there are any any examples or best practices that we can think about from the US and Canada that maybe Wilma or Raul you wanna share. And then second, Raul, specifically for you, um, is there backsliding in terms of equity, diversity and inclusion in Canadian workspaces due to the pandemic and, and how are equity groups affected from a labor perspective? So and maybe Raul, if you wanna address either those or, or also just more broadly, some of the new challenges that we see uh, as a result of the pandemic, and then we can turn to Lima, Wilma. Sure, so in terms of visible minorities in Canada, uh, the, uh, the unemployment rate is, is about, was about twice as high before the pandemic. It still is about twice as high um, um, uh, December, 2020. Uh, the, um, so the impact in that sense maybe hasn't changed that much, but of course there's, uh, uh, there's still a lot of inequity in the, in the Canadian labor market. There's some programs addressing this. Uh, uh, I don't think we're, we're backsliding in terms of the programs. They're there, but uh, they, they, even before the pandemic, even in a labor shortage context, uh, they weren't perfect and, and we still have to do a lot of work there. Um, another aspect of, of inequality is certainly the, the level of, um, of uh, qualifications and education. So most of the job losses, heavy job losses, were in the, in, in the folks uh, who, who don't have university education, which is exactly what was mentioned earlier, I believe, uh, by, Wil by Wilma in the US. Uh, this is very similar. You have uh, uh, between 6 and 12% in terms of the drop of employment uh, uh, for um, uh, people without a university degree and relatively stable employment for, uh, um, for more privileged folks. Um, uh, and in terms of the, um, uh, uh, in terms of other groups, I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll get some, uh, some data at some point. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the Canadian 
overall Canadian system, of course, with the, with the different uh, charter systems and with some proactive uh, employment uh, equity programs as well in terms of uh, uh, hiring programs and, and um, uh, pay equity programs now both on the federal and the uh, some provincial levels. Uh, hopefully they will weather this uh, storm and, and will uh, hopefully continue to produce uh, some results, but it, it was never it was never perfect to begin with, even pre-pandemic. Thanks, Thanks Raul. Um, Wilma, maybe if we can go back as well, one of the questions, and I know that you were, you were thinking of getting to this as well, uh, about the PRO Act yes, uh, yes. for the labor movement. So what, what would it mean for the labor movement in the US? And I know there's been a lot of discussion on you know, is this a transformational moment that we're seeing right now? Uh, maybe t touching on, on both of those aspects. Yeah, sure, Sarah. Um, and, and I see the question that came in was whether the PRO Act, uh, which has been uh, approved by the House of Representatives, um, is likely to be passed and what it would do. And I, I wanna come to that specifically, but let me put it in the larger context of whether in the midst of all these crises, um, this is going to be a transformational moment. And um, I, I see it really kind of focusing in particular on, on government and the role of government in our society and the deep divides. I mean, for, for a long time in this country, this nation has been at war over government, particularly the role in regulating business and the market. Uh, for some governments, a social good, and for others, it's the enemy. Um, and with this deep divide, it has become nearly impossible for government to play the role it should be playing, especially at the federal level. Um, and what we've seen certainly over the last year that government can have a big impact on workers, uh, whether through action or inaction. And the pandemic has certainly unmasked the high cost of government inaction. Um, so on one view, America will never be able to go back to the pre-COVID state of affairs. Everyone will understand the important role that government plays and, and how important it is for it to do its job well. But yet on another view, and some make a persuasive case for, the, a case for this, that the crisis may, these crises may turn out to be less of a watershed than many predict with the, remain, with the weaknesses and injustice that we had before still remaining. Uh, with attitudes about government, including go global governance, just as divided and entrenched. So I think the jury is still out on which of these views will prevail. Indeed, well, I think, what is it? 70 million people voted for Trump. So uh, faced with this dilemma, the, the, the question really is how do we seize this troubled moment um, to ensure a more democratic, equitable future? Um, and I, I think, it, it, certainly some, many have come to question the long prevailing market-centered ideology. There are ongoing debates about work, worker power, including by some conservatives who are beginning to engage in these discussions. Uh, and what we've seen is bipartisan support amongst the public, even if not in Congress, for the spending bills, as I've mentioned before. Recent polling shows that um, there are more people now uh, who worry more about government helping its citizens rather than spending too much. So it's still pretty evenly divided, but the, the, the trend is in the right direction. And, and Biden has been delivering with, with the American Rescue Plan, the 1.9 trillion stimulus package that passed and with the, uh, the American Rescue Plan and the American Families Plan, again, uh, over uh, 2 trillion, one and a half million in the other case. Um, so there is hope for, for measures that will really radically transform the economy or have the potential to. So that then leads to the question, is this the moment when at long last we're gonna have labor law reform? American labor law has not been significantly changed since 1947, notwithstanding pretty rad radical changes in our economy since then. Every effort at labor law reform, including most recently during the Obama administration, ended in gridlock. Um, there is probably no other major American legal regime that has been so insulated from significant change for so long. And that is because of the deep polarization over these issues. So the question is, is this time gonna be different? 
uh, as the have the crises of the last year, has their growing worker and citizen activism of the last few years, as a changing views about government, has this all been enough to get to a different result this time with labor law reform? I don't. To answer the question, I don't know. Uh, certainly, organized labor is very committed to making sure it happen. It happens. This week is a week of action. Uh, but so far, only 47 of the 50 senators have uh, signed on to endorse this law. Um, so I don't know, do the math. Certainly um, without, without a change in the filibuster rules, and we need not get into that in depth, um, I would say this is an uphill battle. But I guess my philosophy is never say never. Um, so maybe this time will be different. Uh, but we are nonetheless left with the fact that the country is still deeply divided and notwithstanding the substantial uh, fiscal support measures which have been enacted, which have raised the IMF's recent projections about growth in the United States, but that's just GDP, that's not inequality. Um, so not, notwithstanding um, those, those positive uh, positive outlook, uh, much still remains to be done. And certainly labor law reform, while not a panacea, would be a, certainly a big step in the right direction in addressing these longstanding problems. Thanks, Wilma. And, and I think that's both a, a great place to start closing and, and convenient because we have four minutes left. So, uh, you know, as Wilma was saying, how do we, how do we seize this moment? And, and how do we build back better? I'd like to hear just one minute from, from each of you and thinking about if we're forward looking and looking at the recovery, how do we make sure it's human centered and that workers and, and worker organizations are at the center? So maybe reverse order from, from how we started. I'll start with Raul and then Dirk and then Wilma. Yes, sure, of course. And I, I, um, I wanna pick up with the binding social dialogue and worker representation uh, um, uh, framework here because it, it's, it's proven that it works. There's study after study that health and safety outcomes, for example, are better when you have uh, a binding worker participation in it. Uh, and uh, so uh, certainly it's, uh, it's still a mystery to me that only nine out of 10 Canadian provinces have binding uh, committees in all sectors. Um, uh, and certainly they're not yet for all sizes of uh, uh, of um, uh, workplaces either. Um, uh, now, there's lots of issues that are coming. Uh, telework, uh, how, how do we deal with this? Uh, how do we represent workers who are potentially in very dangerous, difficult situations at home? Uh, new forms of work and workers. Uh, the platform economy, uh, there's a boom of uh, food and goods delivery going on, and these folks are not necessarily in the traditional uh, sort of labor uh, relations because they're considered independent workers. So how do we include them? How do labor organizations reach out to them? And how do we get uh, binding uh, mechanisms of having these folks involved in their in their um, health and safety, but also then obviously in other uh, conditions of their work? Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, Thanks so much, Raul. Um, Ed Dirk, closing closing thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Um, well. First of all, I think this feeling of um, an, added, um, an added privilege of home office is a very subjective feeling. Um, and so I think we have to do both. We have still to protect workers in the companies and we will have to protect or to deal with the work conditions of those that stay at home for months and months and months. And it's not healthy as well. You can see it. I am privileged because I can stand while working. Not everyone is able to do so. Um, however, um, my really wish is to end the pandemic as soon as possible. Germany is really back um, um, concerning vaccination. We only have around about 25% of the population vaccinated yet. Um, but as soon as pandemic ends, I think there are many, many um, challenges we have to deal with, and I'm sure we will deal with, um, especially it was our main topic before pandemic, the building of a social and ecological transformation and economy in future, um, decarbonization 
is the main word in Germany at the moment. So we will have an economy with, um, uh, that will be decarbonized soon. Uh, for example, the engines in car won't be work with petrol any longer, but with electricity. Um, and that has major impact in the working conditions of our colleagues. And I really hope we can deal with this as soon as possible and not too much with fighting the coronavirus. I think, I think we're all hoping, all hoping for the same, Dirk, but thanks very much for your closing words and Wilma, last but not least. Yeah, just very quickly, um, we haven't met, mentioned the recent loss uh, at the Amazon warehouse in Alabama. And I, I guess I like to be optimistic that notwithstanding the defeat, this election brought so much attention um, to the situation of workers, essential workers, particularly in the US South, uh, to the gross disparity of power between a company like Amazon and its workforce, the David and Goliath aspect, its compulsion to remain non-union and the weaknesses of labor law. And as I said before, while enactment of labor law reform isn't the complete panacea for our economic woes, certainly a stronger labor law making it easier for workers to organize and bargain collectively with stronger remedies and stronger penalties would go a long way uh, to address the injustices and structural weaknesses. And my last word is to me, one of the more hopeful aspects of this moment is that the longstanding and relentless war on government that's existed in this country for several decades has died down. I'm not saying it's dead, but it certainly has died down and that's a, a major relief. So thank you. No, thank you. Thank you, uh, Raul and Dirk and Wilma very much for spending your time and sharing your expertise. I, I learned a lot and, and I hope to our audience uh, that you enjoyed it as well. To FES, thanks very much for hosting. And to our audience, uh, FES has put in a few links in the chat uh, to follow the discussion, continue to follow up on it, uh, as well as the Georgetown discussion later this week, uh, where I believe, Raul, you'll talk a little bit about some of the teleworking uh, questions and, and gig economy questions that you raised there too. So last words, thanks so much everyone uh, for making the time and we hope to continue this discussion. Thank you. Thank you.